Mr. Ramaswamy, thank you for joining us for the NBC News Des Moines Register interview series, Closing Arguments, Iowa. Good to be here. Welcome to the Des Moines Register newsroom. It's good to be here. So you completed yesterday what you're calling the double Grassley, the first time we've seen somebody complete the 99 county tour twice. Um, but so far, if there's a groundswell of support for your campaign, it's yet to materialize in the polls. You said last week that you think you can win the Iowa caucuses. What are you seeing? What evidence on the ground do you see that the polls and the pundits are missing right now? Just, you know, I mean, take our biggest event last night. It was pretty representative of what we're seeing across the board. Ninety percent of the people who came up afterwards taking pictures, saying they support us, signing up as volunteers, are first-time caucus goers. So I think a lot of the polls are badly underestimating the level of support we have from college campuses, from libertarians, from conservatives and America First patriots, but who have not shown up at a traditional Republican caucus before. And so if those people come out, and I expect they will, they tell us they will, they're very actively engaged with our campaign, those numbers are growing by the week, I think we're going to be very successful at the Iowa caucus. I am highly confident we're going to shatter the expectations that have been set for us, and I do believe we have a shot at winning the Iowa caucus if many of those people do come out. And so I feel very good about where we sit, and we're excited for the path to the finish line. Well, you've been setting a lot of those expectations for yourself, um, you know, saying that you can beat Donald Trump, who right now is polling in the Des Moines Register NBC News Iowa poll at 51 percent. You're at 6 percent. Um, you know, what happens if you don't shock the world? Would you be willing to continue your campaign into New Hampshire? Well, I'll say a couple of things. I'm going in this to the very end, and I'll tell you why. But if you look at a lot of that, even a lot of that polling, which I think is incomplete, some of those recent polls show I'm the runaway favorite for the second choice to Donald Trump, which suggests that people are actually weighing those options very carefully. There was a gentleman who came to one of our events in northeastern Iowa yesterday. He was wearing a Trump 2024 hat. <laughs> he came to my event, and, and, we were, and he asked a question. So I you know, lightly called out in a, in a jovial fashion. I said, I noticed the hat you're wearing. He says, yeah, I'm wearing the hat, but I'm supporting you. I think it needs to be somebody different. I'm convinced of that, but it's what this represents. And that actually spoke to me. It was interesting. And I just remember this because this was yesterday, but we see evidence of that across the board of people who absolutely do say they support Donald Trump. In many sense, I support Donald Trump and his legacy as U.S. president. I respect what his contributions are to this country. But when making the choice of who's going to lead our America first movement to the next level, that's a separate choice. I do think we're in the middle of a kind of cold cultural war in this country between those of us who love the United States of America and a fringe minority who hates this country and what we stand for. And when it comes to selecting a commander in chief, a general to lead us to victory in that war, I think I'm best positioned to do it with fresh legs as a leader who is not yet wounded in that war. And I do think a lot of people see that back in me as well and will be making that choice accordingly on January 15th. And to the point about the folks who are coming to your events, I think you've seen that there are those who are coming to your events who are having a hard time yeah. letting go of former President Trump. There was a woman who attended one of your events recently who uh, actually stood up and asked you a question. She was speaking about former President Trump and she asked you, she said, how do we not go caucus for him? How do we not vote for the guy that they're trying to tear apart? It feels wrong to abandon him. And I think we've all seen that sentiment across the Republican Party. Do you agree with your opponent, Ron DeSantis, who has also said that Trump's legal troubles have fundamentally changed the dynamics of this primary, given that the troubles keep coming and they keep boosting him? Do you agree with that? I have a different view on this than Ron DeSantis. I think he's looking at it in the way that a traditional politician playing and gaming together, how many delegates you collect would look at it. I'm looking at it through the lens of what's right for the country. And I think one difference, an area of difference where you see that is when they've eliminated Donald Trump from the ballots in places like Maine and potentially even in Colorado, I was the clearest and first and only one still to state that I would remove myself from those ballots. And I think that many people here appreciate that, but whether or not they appreciate it, that's the right thing to do, to say that if there's going to be election interference, not going through a legal process or otherwise, just one individual in a state like Maine deciding, waking up on a given day and saying that Donald Trump's going to be removed from the ballot, that's the wrong thing for our country. And so I stood up for that just as I was the first and only person to clearly stand up against these politicized prosecutions against Donald Trump. 
I think it's very different than Ron DeSantis, who's been focused on collecting delegates. Right, but from all otherwise. of that has helped him in this primary. Well, his numbers have gone up every time these legal threats have come his way. Look, I'm not a political analyst. I'm a candidate for U.S. president. But you with see a the, num the same country. numbers we do. Well, I I'm in this. Dasha, here's my approach to running this race. I'm going to tell people who I am and what I stand for. Share my true convictions. Share it honestly without a filter. And my deal with the voters is you don't have to agree with 100 percent of what I say to support me. But what you know about me that's different than anybody else, I think, in American politics today, certainly in this race, is I will tell you what I believe 100 percent of the time. And I think that that's a longer sales cycle. Right. I think that Iowans, you know, you know this well, wait until the end. They're very thoughtful about making their decisions. They're evaluating people almost as a job interview. And that's what this is. This is a job interview to be the next U.S. president. And I've not seen people anywhere in this country as thoughtful as Iowa about taking that process really seriously. So I think in the next 10 days is when a lot of those people will be making their final decisions. And my bet is they're going to reward the candidate who has been frank, who has been brutally direct with them through this process, not treating it as a political horse race analyst. The questions you're asking are fair questions to ask to a candidate. I think most other candidates think about it this way. What's being reflected in the poll numbers is what I'm saying, working or not, adjusting accordingly. That's what traditional politicians do, not me. I would rather share my true convictions and lose this race than to win by playing that political snakes and ladders. So I'm just not doing that because I think it drains my inner core out of me if I were to be doing it. I prefer to bring people use the word authenticity. What does it mean? Just tell people what you believe. Be unvarnished about it. Don't worry about what that's going to do to you in the polls or not. My whole bet in this campaign is that's actually going to be the most successful approach in the end. My bet is that's going to be the most successful approach here in Iowa at the very end of the process, which is what we're entering right now as well. But if I've told everybody in the state and everybody in the state really knows who we are as a family and what we stand for, and then they decide to go after somebody else or go for somebody else, I'm at peace with that. My bet is, though, they're actually going to reward that authenticity, especially because of the people we see on the ground. I think they have a sixth sense for a politician who's given them poll tested slogans versus somebody who's telling them the truth. Not only do we do the full double Grassley, and we weren't even aiming to do that. It was a byproduct of a comprehensive strategy of doing, I think, more events than all of the other campaign candidates combined. We're going to be over 330 events, live events with Iowans across the state. By the end of this process, that's not only more than the rest of the field combined. I, I, as far as I know, it might be the most ever that somebody has done. I think people here reward that. They understand the setting where even what they're seeing right now in this conversation will be cut. There will be TV screens in between them. There's 30-second ads that they're probably watching in between this and whatever the next program is. In a certain sense, that's fake. And I think many Iowans sense that. And so my hope is that they reward the candidate, not just that worked the hardest, and I certainly have, but the candidate who was, I think, the most unvarnished in sharing the things that other candidates probably know to be true but can't touch. Take the CO2 pipeline that's being built across half the state. Well, and we do want candidate. to talk about right. that, but we have limited time, so sure. I just want to get to a few other topics. In, in a lot of ways, you, you have been unvarnished about some of these hot topics in the news right now. You have said that you would pardon former President Trump. It would be a day one pardon. Why do you think that's the best decision for the country? I think it's the best decision for this country for two reasons. One is those prosecutions are themselves politicized and using unprecedented legal theories that obviously would never have been levied unless there was a political motivation at issue, which is to eliminate Donald Trump from contention. I also think it's the right thing to do to unite this country and move our country forward. I do believe I am the single best equipped candidate to lead this country forward, unite the country, not through some fake national unity of compromising on principles and having a split the baby difference on some policies. No, that's not how I'm going to unite the country. I think the way I'll unite this country is by standing for the shared ideals that actually unite all of us as Americans that set this country into motion in 1776. So and one of those is one standard of the rule of law. And another is that we, the people, select who leads this country, not unelected bureaucrats. And I will stand for that principle. So to follow that logic there, would you then potentially ask Republicans to stand down on investigations of President Biden in the spirit of not putting the country through more turmoil? If they were using unprecedented legal theories to invest and investigate and torture the law to do that, then I would say then I wouldn't want that in some other fringe personal charge. That's not what's happening now, though with respect to specifically what's going on in Ukraine. 
the very country that paid a five million dollar alleged bribe to Hunter Biden. This is relevant to the actual policies of the country right now when that very president is sending two hundred billion dollars of our taxpayer money to that same country. If this is affecting our foreign policy and I'm unsparing with Republicans or Democrats alike, you think about the likes of Nikki Haley and a lot of the foreign dealings and a lot of the military contracting work. If that's actually affecting the policies that affect everyday Americans and the lives of our sons and daughters, that absolutely is a an important area for investigation. What about Hunter Biden, who's not a, impacting policy? Would you well, would I, you pardon Hunter Biden? So the, on this Ukraine charges, I think we need to go all the way to the very bottom of it. I do think it's impacting policy, Dasha. But and Hunter Biden, really the, the gun charges, the other charges that aren't impacting policy, would you pardon? The ones that I'm laser focused on and I absolutely would not pardon for, because I think we need to get to the bottom of it if he is convicted, is if that $5 million bribe was indeed paid to him for reasons to influence U.S. policy, and then watching it successfully influence U.S. policy. If that's proven in a court of law, I would not pardon Hunter Biden. But the charges right now are focused on the gun charges. Well, this, wh where I think they need to be focused is on the essence But right of now, on the gun charges, would you consider well, I pardoning? Think a lot of the, I think a lot of that is a deflection, Dasha. I think it's a deflection by the Democrats. I think that they're bringing a thin, flimsy charge on an unrelated matter to deflect the plot away from where the investigation needs to be focused. And so on my watch and at my encouragement, and I've been very clear about this, we need to be crystal clear about whether the Biden family, and I think I have the same concern if it's a Republican in the same shoes, sells off our foreign policy to make their family wealthy. That's wrong no matter who does it, Republican or Democrat. I'm even handed about that. But I do think that we need to apply one standard of the rule of law. That's not inventing a novel legal theory. That's basics of bribery and affecting our foreign policy. That would be wrong. And if that's proven in a court of law, I would not pardon Hunter Biden for it. I want to ask again about Donald Trump. You said um, recently at a campaign stop that the left won't let Donald Trump get anywhere near the White House. What did you mean by that? I don't know did if I say the left or I said that broadly the system this was what I believe I've been saying. Because I don't think this is a left versus right issue necessarily or Republican versus Democrat issue. I think a lot of the establishment pervades even the Republican Party as well. So I don't view this through partisan terms. But I believe the system is making crystal clear by the day that they will not let this man, by hell or high water, get anywhere near the White House again. And I believe they're making it increasingly clear they will stop at nothing to stop him from getting close to the White House. I believe it's a bit of a trap they've laid for many of the Republican Party members who believe that they're voting for Donald Trump in the expectation he's going to be the president. I think there's something else altogether going on here where they want to narrow this down to be a two-horse race between Donald Trump and somebody else. I have my views on who that is and to be able to prop up that other chosen puppet by eliminating Donald Trump from contention. You don't have to stretch the imagination to see first the protests, then the civil suits, then the state level prosecution, then the federal prosecutions, and then now even without prosecution, the multiple efforts across this country to keep him off the ballot. And that's just in 2023. As we enter 2024, I predict that's just gonna be the tip of the iceberg. This is a system, an establishment that has an anaphylactic response to this man. And so I respect his contributions to this country. I think a lot of our base, myself included, loves the man because he got this fight started. But I think now it's our job to finish it. And I think I'm the person in this race who can take our America First agenda to the next level. Do it by bringing in young people and others into our movement that haven't been part of the Republican Party or even the America First movement. That's my job to take what Donald Trump started, but to take this to the next level go far further on many policies than he did, but also unite this country in the process. And yes, to do it as a candidate who has not yet been wounded in the war they've waged on him. So are you I running? think it's wrong, but that's what I believe. So are you running expecting that he won't be in the race in November? I have deep concerns as an American that this system is going to take him out of contention. I've done everything in my power to limit the likelihood of that happening. I called on every other Republican to join me in saying, when they removed him from the ballot in Maine and Colorado, I voluntarily said I would remove myself too. And I asked Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley and Chris Christie, I demanded that they do the same thing because that's how you nullify the impact of that election interference to say if they're going to behave this way in Maine, then Maine won't count in our GOP primary. I have tried my best and gone to the fullest extent I can. But if we open our eyes to a reality, I think that there is a unstoppable force attempting to move what they view as an unmovable object. But eventually, I'm worried that that unstoppable force of the system is going to result in something that isn't good for the country, 
But I refuse to be then a pass- passive bystander watching them prop up who their chosen puppet is. I believe that it's my responsibility to take our America First movement to the next level. That's not how I want this to play out. But I'm worried that's the direction things are going. If you believe the system is rigged against former President Trump and you're willing to go so far as to pull out of Colorado and Maine because they won't pull, put him on the ballot, why not then go further and make the ultimate statement and, and pull out of the race if you think that it's rigged? Oh, it's, it's obviously what, what they're planning to do. They want this to be a two-horse race and they want their chosen puppet to win the race by eliminating Donald Trump. I'm not going to let him get away with that plan. To the contrary... I worry that our Republican base and many Trump supporters are falling for that. But by pulling out of Maine and Colorado, you're losing delegates anyway. So why not? Why not pull out altogether and say, I'm not playing this game? You refuse to play a lot of games. Why not? The whole the whole point is I'm in this for the country. Okay, so I'm going to do the right thing and stand on principle. I still hold out hope. I'm going to continue to call out Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley and Chris Christie. I think that they will be exposed as being, I think, culpable indirectly culpable for facilitating this election interference. And so I expect and continue to demand that they pull out of any ballot in which Donald Trump's illegally removed from that ballot, Maine and Colorado included. That's how we nullify that impact. So everything I'm doing is how am I having a maximum positive impact on our country? But I think that I will refuse to be a bystander watching this to be narrowed down to a two horse race where I believe they have a clear plan and intention of removing Donald Trump, eliminating him from competition by whatever means necessary. And I think it is my responsibility to our America First movement. I think it's my responsibility to our country to make sure that we don't have a mega donor class establishment favored puppet waltzing into the White House and instead a patriot who actually cares about this country, who is capable of taking that America First agenda to the next level. And in many cases, I think I am going further than Donald Trump. I've been crystal clear that I would shut down the FBI, not implement incremental reform. I've offered a comprehensive plan to do it. I've said that I would use our own military, not just building a southern border wall, but use our own military to secure our own borders in this country. End birthright citizenship for the kids of illegals. The 14th Amendment, I believe, is crystal clear on the fact that it does not apply to those kids of illegals. So both on policy and my ability to execute, my ability to bring younger people into this movement, but also perhaps most relevant this year, my ability to get to the finish line. It's my obligation to make sure we stay in this race through the end. And I expect that I will be the next president of the United States. I don't expect that the task of uniting and leading this country is going to be an easy one. I think it's going to take a leader with a lot of attributes, but that's why I'm in this. But why wouldn't that same rigged system, if you're going even further than Donald Trump, why wouldn't it work against you too? Well, look, they they don't have on me what they have on him. You can just look right now. They've got four different wars they've waged on this man. At the end of the day, if we need a commander in chief who's going to lead us to victory, I think that our base needs to choose the general who is not yet wounded in that war. Right. And and, and you've said this. And I'm going to say one more thing, Dash, about this. This is important. I think it takes two things to actually get this right. One is an outsider who can break the system when necessary. I bring that. Trump brings that, too. But it also takes an outsider who knows and deeply understands the law and the constitution of this country. I think in many ways, this managerial class in the swamp, they duped Donald Trump. They told him you couldn't fire 75% of those federal bureaucrats because of civil service protections. That's not true. You absolutely can in the context of a mass firing. Same thing from ending birthright citizenship to using our military to actually use even local law enforcement for mass deportations out of this country. They duped Trump in a way that they won't be duping me. And those two things don't usually go together, the academic law type and the business guy who can break things. The fact that those two things don't usually go together, well, that's what pulls me into this race and gives me a duty to lead this country as I expect. Well, let me ask you, in recent weeks, you've you've put a lot of ideas out there. You've uh, suggested on the campaign trail that January 6th was an inside job, that the plot to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer was a job of inside entrapment that the house republicans let let me finish that that the house republicans impeachment inquiry is part of a democratic plot to sideline biden um that there is a devious democratic scheme to actually nominate nikki haley the reality is none of these are top issues for iowan 
for Iowa voters. So why are you focused on these conspiracy theories? Well, focused is a heavy-handed word, Dasha. If you take 80% of what I said, I'm talking about policy and future direction of the country, talking about how we'll increase the supply of energy to bring down the cost for everyday Americans. And so that's 80% of what I'm talking about. But I'm not going to hide from what I do believe are realities hiding in plain sight that people deserve to know about, which the last item that you described. It's not a secret that Larry Fink is going to fundraisers of Nikki Haley, propping her up that actually one of the biggest funders of the lawsuits against Trump, including efforts to keep him off the ballot, is Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. That's a quarter million dollar donor to Super PAC supporting Nikki Haley. And so I reject this mainstream media general narrative of dismissing something as a conspiracy theory, when in fact I'm a big fan of going after facts hiding in plain sight. But you know you that when Gretchen you say Whitmer. these things, you know when you bring up the Gretchen Whitmer thing, you know when you bring up January 6th. grounded 6, in fact. January 6th being an inside job. Yes, 80% of what you talk about might be policy, but when you hit those issues, that's going to take over the news cycle. You know it, how it works. I don't works. think it should. I'm speaking the truth but as it does. You're a smart guy. You know how board. it works. Are you using that to, to get attention as you've been to slumping the contrary, in the contrary, To the contrary, I'm actually speaking. You, could, you have a lot of political analysts that look at this and say exactly what you're saying. Why aren't you just saying what causes you to pull better? It's what every other political candidate's doing. They're taking what their consultants serve them up. Here's what the voters say are the top issues. Spout back to them what the voters want to hear. So why I'm sharing my true convictions. And I think if we want to revive our constitutional republic, we deserve a government that tells the people the truth again. Not just when it's easy, but when it is hard. Our government has systematically lied to us on things that really matter. Of the origin of COVID-19, we were told for years that it didn't come from a lab in China when it absolutely did. In fact, you were suppressed on social media for saying it. The eve of the last election, I think it's shameful that the Hunter Biden laptop story was systematically suppressed but so voters didn't have that information. But that's not you're talking about. You're talking about Gretchen about, Whitmer being an inside a, job of entrapment. I'm talking about a government that has lied to its people, the same FBI that's investigating conservatives, the same FBI and the same law enforcement apparatus, Jack Smith, that has subpoenaed millions of Americans for anybody who liked or retweeted a Donald Trump post in 2020. That's Orwellian, but that's the same federal law enforcement apparatus that put people up to an alleged kidnapping plot that they otherwise wouldn't have been put up to. Multiple defendants acquitted on grounds of entrapment. And so is this, is this a top issue that voters bring up on the mind of voters? Absolutely it's not. But if the mainstream media is pushing, and the establishment in both parties is so pushing one not, established narrative. So if it's not a priority for voters, why are you so focused on it? Because truth is a priority for me. That's the answer. You truth know, is the truth is the priority for this campaign. And I don't need to be speaking to what every other professional politician is spouting off. We need to speak the hard truths that other candidates are unwilling to touch. And even though that doesn't poll necessarily on what you know, NBC or the Des Moines Register or another media outlet is going to ask voters what are the top issues on their mind. It's important. What really is important to many voters, I believe, is a government that trusts them with the hard truth again. That hasn't happened for a very long time. And so my view is if that's what the voters want, that's what they're going to get from me. If they want somebody who's going to incrementally reform things, change tax rates by 1% one direction or another, and call that a legislative accomplishment, go with somebody else. That's not me. But if you want a candidate who is actually going to revive the ideals of 1776, who is going to trust the people transparently with what the government knows to be true, if you want a government that actually is of and for and by the people again, I think I'm the sole candidate in this race who can deliver that. And that choice is up to the voters. But I believe that's what the voters will want. I if not, I won't be the president. Mr. Ramaswamy. But if I it is, I will. I want to move us along a little bit. I was former U.S. Representative Steve King endorsed your campaign yes. last night. Uh, Steve King was, was voted out of office by Iowa Republicans in the state's most conservative district. Do you think it helps your campaign to align yourself with him? I think it helps to have his endorsement in the sense that it helps to have anybody who's aligned with your own views and vision to say publicly that they support you. I'm proud to have his endorsement. I also think a lot of the media's narrative, I've gotten to know him. I didn't know him before this race. I've only gotten to know him in the last couple of months. But I will tell you, he has earned my trust for me to be able to say when he tells me what the New York Times and others reported about him was downright false, I believe him sooner than I believe the New York Times because I've had my experiences with both. I think he's an honest, direct, plain-spoken, and good-hearted patriot for this country. I'm proud to have his endorsement. And I think we've found common cause on a lot of other issues that other Republican candidates have been unwilling to touch from the CO2 pipelines, illegal use of eminent domain to seize farmland from innocent farmers in this state, to, yes, my view that we do need border security. He was called racist in part for calling for building the wall before that was popular. Well, now that's actually mainstream 
thinking in both major political parties. And so in some ways, I think he was ahead of his time. He's not only, I think, a thoughtful man, but a person who cares about this country, and I'm proud to have his endorsement. Steve King was stripped of his committee assignments in 2019. You mentioned the New York Times. Wrong. He was quoted as saying, white nationalist, white supremacist, Western civilization. How did that language become offensive? Do you agree with those comments? Well, I think that I take Steve King's words over the New York Times that he didn't say those things. And I've had my own experiences with the media. And I understand that if Steve King, who I've gotten to know, and I really believe that this is an honest man, is a patriot who cares about speaking the truth, versus some New York Times reporter who hasn't, hasn't offered a shred of evidence that he said such a thing. First of all, let's start with that. I don't even think those are the facts. I think there's something deeper, though. And I actually was looking at this because someone sent this to me last night after, after a lot of the backlash relating to the Steve King endorsement. They sent a whole New York Times compilation of all the racist things he said, supposedly racist things he said. Well, actually, some of them are just calling for basic border security in the United States, calling for English as the national language in the United States, pointing out the criminality of many people who have come to this country illegally. A lot of that isn't racist at all. And so when you take a look at the New York Times' as compilation of all of the supposedly racist things he said, I'd encourage people to do that. Maybe I'll post it today. People can judge for themselves. Is that really racist or is this a man who's actually speaking his convictions that are true and good-hearted that the mainstream media and the New York Times in this case in particular has decided to label as a word that they know will alienate people? That's not the cancel culture we want in our country. Have the open debate. Maybe you disagree that English should be the national language of the United States, but let's have that debate in the open instead of castigating somebody and making them a pariah. People asked me even last night, well, will you denounce white supremacy? We live in a moment where, don't forget, a lot of the left has defined white supremacy to include things like punctuality or the written word. This is just as of a couple of years ago. Even many in the DEI Academy, in academia and otherwise, have said concepts like this are vestiges of white supremacy. These words have ceased to mean anything. And so if somebody wants to define white supremacy for me, then we can actually have a serious conversation about it. But until then, I think a lot of this is actually a charade. I think Steve King was de defeated in part because of a donor establishment that used a toxic influence on money and politics to be able to disfavor him. But this is somebody who I believe is a patriot. I'm proud to have his endorsement. I'm not afraid to say it, and I think that that's what makes me different than a lot of the other candidates. Let's talk about what, uh, white supremacy and what happened last night for a moment, because when you were talking to reporters last night, you called white supremacy a myth. When someone asked you about Dylan Roof, you said you didn't know who that is. Have you looked up what happened in 2015? Yeah, yeah look, I, I, I've, said, I've, I've said this last night. Invidious racial discrimination is wrong no matter how it happens. But if a Washington Post reporter is asking me almost like a catechism Whatever question I said, I'm against invidious racial discrimination, whatever form it takes, but says, do you denounce white supremacy? It's incumbent on us for us to define what white supremacy is. I wrote my book, Woke Inc., and I've written about the detailed understanding of what the popular understanding of these terms have come to mean. Do you believe punctuality is a vestige of white supremacy, Dasha? Look, because if you, you don't, then you have a disagreement about many of the people who are defining those terms or the written word or the use or the nuclear family. This is. I, these aren't my words. These are the words of intellectual proponents from Ibram Kendi to the Ayanna Presleys to BLM that have said these are vestiges well, of white supremacy. So Mr. we Ramos can't Lobby, have it both ways. Do, though, we have to have an choose, honest you discussion. You straw man arguments. I'm not, Last this is not night, a straw you, man. You brought, you this brought is not up Jussie man. Smollett as the, oh, the best Jussie example Smollett of white supremacy. was the supremacy. hottest thing in news in the back of a fake yes. actual attack on him that we have to contend with. And, this is and actually, yet, and yet you have examples like the Buffalo shooter in New York just in 2022. You have other examples. But you are also cherry picking when you bring up Jussie so I'll look, I'll look at all of the statistics. More black Absolutely. on black crime. If you really care about actual crime against black Americans, let's get to the root causes of it in the inner cities of this look, country. The anti-defamation league tracked a 38% increase in white supremacist propaganda last who's, who's year. Who's tracking that? The anti-defamation league. Yeah, the ADL. I don't think is a particularly credible source so when who they are have cherry picked to look information. To when we're talking about, I would this. suggest. I would suggest look at the, there's a table, two by two table. Federal law enforcement data, which you could say what you do. Maybe maybe we shouldn't believe that either. But okay. look at black the on Asian crime, black hate on black crimes, crime, the FBI white on black crime. crime statistics. That's a, a law enforcement agency. Uh, 59.1 percent was based itself. on race, ethnicity, I look at absolute and violence. ancestry, saying hate crimes rose 12 percent between 2020 Dr. and 2021. Look at the absolute crimes themselves. What they classify as a hate crime is itself a political judgment. I think that when you actually care about protecting life, if you want to say Black Lives Matter, let's look at where Black Lives are actually being lost. 
It's in the cities at the heart of other look, black Americans and criminals and this, and that's that are absolutely restrained by the absence that we talk of about Virginia as well. Police, but are we supposed we to be. ignore white supremacist hate crimes? We're not supposed to ignore any kind of crime, Dasha. That's what I say. But what I see is a selective reporting. Take the Nashville Transgender Shooter Manifesto. Every shooter manifesto in a mass shooting has been released within 48 hours, except for that one shooter in Nashville. Now, it ended up being leaked. What do you see? It wasn't a, it wasn't a white supremacist. It was somebody that was actually making fun of using derogatory terms. I okay, believe so why are you okay was talking about that, that manifesto and not okay talking not about the manifesto okay. from I'm okay talking the about 2015 both. I'm more than okay shooting. talking about both. But what I'm asking is, why is the mainstream media suppress that one? Why did the police suppress that one? Why was that the one shooter manifesto? that of all of the mass shootings, every other shooter manifesto has been released. I'm focused on that one because that's the one that's been hidden from us. And it comes back to the point of my candidacy and the way I'm gonna run this country. Trust the people with the truth. If it doesn't match but your narrative, the reality is right now, I think the media did not hold the police accountable. They would have been demanding that. Republicans are actually starting to gain was, ground, gain traction that was with a, the black community, with Latino and, voters. And, and, do and not worry thing. that your no, rhetoric think, is pushing them away. There are folks to the in, contrary. In I think we're going to bring GOP black people right now, into this movement. Who are movement. concerned about your rhetoric? Well, you know what? I'm concerned about their corruption. If you have somebody who actually one of the most one of a prominent black influencer the other day, she's what did she say? I've been black my whole life, and this man could actually unify this country in response to a long exchange I had with a black pastor who at an event here in Iowa did challenge me with a hard question, asking me, are my views against affirmative action, how do those align with historical affirmative racial injustice? Affirmative action is a debate that is being had. If, you I, may, can, you can if I may just finish this, if I may finish my point, with Dasha, racism, I think I will be better you're positioned. you denying that racism is a I've problem. never des denied that racism is a problem. If you listen to the response I gave to that black pastor, my whole point is racism has been a major problem for most of our national history. But we're getting close to the promised land that Martin Luther King envisioned. We're as darn close to it as we ever have been. And so what bothers the heck out of me is it's right when we're close to that promised land. Martin Luther King said it. I may not get there with you, and he didn't get there with us. But I think it desecrates the legacy of our civil rights movement, desecrates the legacy of Martin Luther King, that right when we get closest to the point of having racial equality and gender equality and even opportunities for people of minorities of many types, are we perfect? No. But are we as close as we've ever been? Yes, we have to then obsess over systemic racism, to then obsess over white guilt and otherwise. We're creating new waves of racism, Dasha, that we otherwise would have avoided right when we're closest to having achieved what even the proponents of the civil rights movement would have dreamed of. That's what bothers me. My exchange with that black pastor about, about a week or so ago, right here in Iowa, not far from where we are, was in Indianola, not far from where we are in Des Moines, was that we're founded on the pursuit of a more perfect union the pursuit of liberty, equality, and justice for all. And I reject this left-wing narrative that's creating more artificial division. So I believe I will bring more black and Hispanic voters into our movement, not by saying fake poll-tested slogans, but by speaking the hard truth that we've been imperfect in our past, but let us celebrate the progress we've made and reject the media's cherry-picking narratives to actually get to the truth of the matter. And now, if we care about black lives, the things we're going to do isn't obsessing about white supremacy. Mr. It's actually Ramaswamy. fixing the problems in our cities, which I will do as our president. I want to move us on. We're, we're nearly out of time. Let's do a couple of really quick questions sure. as a lightning round to clear this out. Um, you've proposed major changes to the national election system. Do you yes. have faith in Iowa's caucus process, and will you accept the results? Look, I would love to accept the results if this is fairly conducted, as I expect and hope that it will be. But I do think at the national electoral system, we need single day voting on election day as a national holiday with paper ballots, government issued ID to match the voter file and English as the sole language on a ballot. I stand by that. That's not how the national election is going to be conducted in November, though. Would you accept a Biden victory in November if that's how things go? And is it time I don't think to... that's how things are going to go. First but if all. that's how it goes, would you accept it? If that's how it goes through a free and fair election system, then obviously I've, I will accept the results of an electoral process. But what I will tell you, this is we need an electoral process we can trust and believe in. And so that if we're but, your, see that, but, but your I requirements I mean, aren't going to happen by November. Dasha, I think that in some ways this question is based on a fictitious premise that people who are allowed to run for president even are able to run for president. Right now, we're having a discussion about one of the two major candidates being removed forcibly from the ballot. So we have major forms of right, election so interference saying, uh, staring us in the face. So are you saying I want the way to deal things with are that. right now, if I Biden wins, you wouldn't that. accept it? I want to deal with the issues that we have right in front of us, which is we have major so interventions So you can't give a election. direct answer on that right now? Whoever wins the election through a fair and free process, I will accept that result. And I'm committed to making sure that we have a fair and free process in the year ahead. 
and I expect that we will because of efforts of people like me to make sure of it. The election interference in this GOP primary. I mean, literally right you're, now. You're calling, you're saying this election month, interference right now. Right now yes, so. Maine's, Maine's Secretary of State has actively removed one candidate from a ballot without going through any type of judicial process. Yes, that is election interference. And I'm keen on making sure that's set correct. I have full expectations that the Supreme Court will set this correctly. And so with full confidence in our system, which includes three branches of government, including the judicial branch. So are you confident I think it's you'll going be able to, be. to accept the results if Biden I'm, does win the election in November? I'm confident the judicial branch is going to do the right thing, such that we have a process that we can all actually get behind. That's what I'm confident of. And I believe the judicial branch, up to and including the Supreme Court, will do the right thing. And I have confidence in our Supreme Court, the last bastion of an institution that I think we can trust in this country. And I believe and hope and fully expect they're going to get this right. That's what I stand by. Let me ask you this. What do you think is the lesson from January 6th that you take away from it? And what do you think the country should take away from it? I think there are a lot of lessons. First of all, to draw lessons, we need the facts. The government still has not fully released all of the video footage. We've seen it released piecemeal. So the first lesson is this. Just tell us the truth. Whatever it is, if it's ugly, just tell us the truth. Why suppress some video footage and release others? Why not actually be open about how many federal agents or informants were in the field? Why hold people in prison but without actually charging them with a specific crime? Just be open with the public. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is if you tell people they cannot speak, that's when they scream. If you tell people they cannot scream, that's when they tear things down. Systematic censorship in that year leading up to January 6th suppressing some of the most important information about a global pandemic to the most important information about a political candidate on the eve of an election created deep concerns in this country. We should never make those mistakes again. Censorship is wrong no matter who commits it, left or right. So transparency and free speech, they're vital to our country. Those are 1776 lessons that we would do well to remember today as well. And let it also be a reminder that we're skating on thin ice as a country. It's now more important than ever to unite this country around the shared principles that set the United States into motion. That's what I'm in this race to do, and that's, I think, a healthy reminder that we can take from what happened that day. I want to ask you about some. You spoke about a personal experience here in Iowa. You spoke about your wife, Aporva's miscarriage. Does that experience shape how you view abortion policy and whether the law should allow for some abortions when pregnancies aren't viable, like in the case of Kay Cox? So I think that personal experience did shape, I think, my views, and I would say even mine and Apoorva's views, our family's views on abortion. I've been pro-life for a long time. Logic leads me to many of my positions. If brain waves end, and that's when life ends, I think you can't say that life begins any later than when brain waves begin. That's five or six weeks after conception. But here's my view on the abortion issue. I think that the pro-life movement, and I consider myself part of that, hasn't done enough to walk the walk in actually standing for life and pro-life principles. I want to talk about more expansive policies of ease of adac- access to adoption, to child care. And I, for one, I think I'm alone in the GOP on this, but I hope more embrace it. As a man, I will say this. We need to codify sexual responsibility into the law to say that if a woman brings a child to term, she should, at her option, be able to make the man, the principal caretaker, financially responsible for raising that child if it's confirmed by a genetic paternity test. I think that's how we're able to unite the country at least as best we can on this issue, to say it's not about men's rights or women's rights, it's about human rights. In the case of a pregnant woman who was assaulted when the unborn child died, I haven't met one person, left or right, who says that that criminal doesn't deserve liability for that death. That says we share these pro-life instincts in common, and I want us to do better as Republicans to actually stand for those life principles than we have done to date. So in the case of Kate Cox, where that pregnancy was not viable and she had to go through the courts, is it a compassionate message for the GOP to say that she shouldn't? Should, would you have allowed her to have that abortion? Well, I think, Bran, with due respect, I think that you are overlaying a lot of assumptions to say that's not a viable pregnancy. I don't think that that's a correct characterization. The facts are still coming out, and I'm not firsthand in the room with her and her doctor. But I don't think that it is an accepted fact at all that that was not a child who was going to be born. That child absolutely could have been alive if that pregnancy was taken to term. And so I think that a lot of the overlay in the narrative around this has confounded the reality. But what I stand by, what I not a viable pregnancy is is viable until what age after birth? I think these are separate debates and nuances that we deserve to have, rather than just telling the public that that baby would have never made it to term. Which, on my understanding of the facts is actually false. And so we need to get to 
actual detail rather than just using vague terms like viable when that refers to viable even after birth. What I think we need is sensible policies in this country that implement pro-life views. And the pro-life views that I support are no federal funding for Planned Parenthood, which our taxpayers shouldn't be, dollars shouldn't be going to fund Planned Parenthood. I think we need to stand for life in the form of access to adoption, access to child care. I think we can have a legitimate bipartisan discussion about that. And I favor a policy that says this should not be borne exclusively by women. It's wrong. I think men should share in this responsibility equally or at least as equally as we can. I think the woman, if it's confirmed by a genetic paternity test, should legally be able to make the man the sole responsible party for raising that child, which will force men to take responsibility for their sexual decisions on the front end, not just putting this on women. And I think that's the way we need to not only frame, but actually approach this issue to say this issue doesn't have to divide us to a breaking point. We're in this together, that we understand that unborn life is life. We respect it. I believe most people actually share those instincts in common if we don't make this a men versus women's issue. And I, for my part, not just as a Republican, but as a man, am willing to go to the fullest extent possible to stand for those pro-life principles, more access to crisis pregnancy care and otherwise that doesn't exist in the country. Let's have that conversation. And I think that's far more productive than trying to have some sort of split the difference compromise about which week is or isn't the one where you actually draw the line. And let's just get to one final question with an issue that's on the minds of so many with the war in uh, between Israel and Hamas. Uh, you've said in one of your town halls in, in Hampton, Iowa, that Palestinian people live the best life they do anywhere on earth in Israel. Uh, you've also called a two-state solution a myth. Do you believe in a one-state solution? I believe in the role of the U.S. president, which is that I'm running for the president of the United States, not the president of Israel or another country. So I've been very clear in my position on this, Dasha. I think Israel gets to nationally self-determine its future. Israel has the right to exist and to defend its own existence. Those are decisions for Israel to make. Israel's an ally of the United States, and our role as an ally is to give them the diplomatic support that they need to make those decisions. I think that's the most pro-Israel view of anybody in the Republican field, even though it's traditionally different than the standard political orthodoxy. I think what Israel needs is not the UN or the US or the EU second guessing their decisions. And so that's how I think we most strongly support Israel. I think it's the right thing to do as the United States, support Israel diplomatically to be able to defend itself to the fullest. Because what Hamas did, it was subhuman. It was medieval, it was immoral, it was wrong. And Israel absolutely has the right to defend itself and to exist. And Israel has the right to determine its own future, whether a one state solution or otherwise is the right path forward. That's a decision for Israel to make. In the United States, I'm focused on our own border risks. So I would tell Bibi, you can smoke the terrorists on your southern border and we support you doing it. We're going to smoke the terrorists on our own southern border because we have our problems to deal with here at home. And that's how each of our allies will stand for the other diplomatically. And that's how I would lead. All right, Mr. Ramaswamy, any final closing arguments for the Iowans listening right now? I would say that it's going to take somebody from the next generation with fresh legs to reach and lead the new generation of Americans. We don't have to be this nation in decline. I think we still can be a nation in our ascent. And I'm in this, not just as a businessman, but as a father of two sons. I want to be able to look my kids in the eye and actually mean it when we tell them, this is the country where you still get ahead with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that you're free to speak your mind at every step of the way. That's the American dream that I've lived, that my wife Apoorva has lived. We never imagined living the life that we did when my parents came to this money 40 years ago with no money in search of opportunity. That's what we want to pass on to not just our kids, but to every kid in this country. And I think that we don't have a lot of time. If my sons are in high school before we get this right, I don't believe we have a country left. I think this is the election that decides whether we have another 250 years still left in our American journey. I believe we do, but I think it's going to take a leader from the next generation coming from the outside to do it. And that's how I'm going to leave this country. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.